Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roderick Ireland, and on behalf of the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society, I want to welcome you to the first session of our convocation, which is entitled Criminal Justice Professionals of Cover Address Criminal Justice Reform Here and Now. Today's program, which is the first of three sessions on criminal justice reform, will focus on the prosecutor's role in criminal justice reform. We have what we consider to be an exciting, dynamic, provocative group of speakers, both locally and nationally. And we hope they will inform and educate us and perhaps even call us to action. Before we hear from our speakers, I would like to make a few general comments. First, I would like to acknowledge the wonderful turnout we have today. In our virtual audience, we have an awful lot of firepower. Although I cannot acknowledge you by name due to time constraints, you are among our valued guests, which include representatives from law enforcement, the legislature, the executive branch, the judiciary, the community, and the academy, including faculty and students from a number of local colleges and universities. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Each of you honor us with your presence and your, all of us at the Ruffin Society are confident that today's program will be worthy of your time and attention. Now, I'd like to say just a few words about the Ruffin Society. Justice George Lewis Ruffin, who was the first Black graduate from Harvard Law School in 1869, was also the very first African-American judge in the United States. He was a former member of the Massachusetts legislature elected in 1870, and he then sat as a judge for many years in the Charlestown District Court. The Ruffin Society was founded in 1984 by Judge Julian Houston. At that time, it became affiliated with Northeastern University's College of Criminal Justice, now known as the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. That was 37 years ago. And over the years, we have built a strong and mutually supportive relationship. Now, the Ruffin Society is committed to promoting the advancement of minorities within the fields of law and criminal justice and to fostering a better understanding between minority communities and the criminal justice professions. One of the accomplishments of the Ruffin Society that we are most proud of is our Long Road to Justice exhibit. It is an interactive, comprehensive media depiction of the path of African Americans in the Commonwealth's legal system from colonial times to the present. The exhibit has been shown across the Commonwealth in courthouses and on college campuses and is now permanently housed in the Edward W. Brook Courthouse in downtown Boston. I encourage all of you to visit it. Finally, I want to acknowledge the Ruffin Society board members, all of whom have worked extremely hard to put together this year's three session convocation. They are a distinguished group of individuals and are listed on our website. So I won't read their names and titles, but they are on screen. You can also go to the first page of the convocation website and click on the heading that says more and then click on the name members to see who these dedicated and outstanding members are. However, there are two board members whom I would like to rec publicly recognize for their hard work and effort. And they are our two convocation co-chairs, Fred Dashiell and Robert Ward. 
Fred and Bob worked extremely hard on assembling our speakers and honing the themes of each session. And I salute and thank them for their efforts and commitment to excellence. Special thanks also to Sammy Weeks and Alfred Spencer, members of the class of 2022 at Suffolk University Law School, who worked so diligently as research assistants for Fred and Bob for this event. Thank you both. And now we will hear from our host at Northeastern. We are so proud of and grateful for our 37 year partnership and the support and encouragement we have received from the university and its School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. So I am very pleased to introduce our university host who will bring you words of welcome, Dean Uta Poiger of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, followed by director and professor Amy Farrell of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Dean Poiger. Thank you, Judge Ireland. My name is Uta Poiger, as Judge Ireland just mentioned. And um, let me just um, say again that I am indeed the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And I will just say that it's a great honor to say a few words of welcome today at the beginning of the Ruffin Society's convocation, the meetings that you all have put together that are featuring leaders who are transforming criminal justice and the law in this country. Many of them hailing from Massachusetts, many of them, of course, having also a national profile at the same time. Today, we see calls for the reform of criminal, the criminal justice system from groups across the United States. Often these calls are led by the Black Lives Matter movement. The Ruffin Society has a long history of thinking about these matters and of bringing people together who have historically been underrepresented in criminal justice institutions and the law. Like the president of the Ruffin Society, I have to say that we at Northeastern are very proud of the 37 year partnership with Northeastern School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, which for the last 10 or 11 years has also translated into collaborations with the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. And it was, for example, very rewarding to see how public historians, criminologists work together with the Ruffin Society in the refurbishment of the Long Road to Justice exhibit a few years ago. So it's these kinds of collaborations that the partnership with the Ruffin Society has made possible also for our students. The Ruffin Society has partnered with the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice on past convocations, which have addressed race and the criminal justice system, and also the barriers to employment in the criminal justice system for people of color. Today's convocation and those events that follow bring together a highly distinguished group of criminal justice professionals to discuss the reform efforts underway nationally, as well as the challenges that continue to exist to these reforms. We would like to thank the Ruffin Society under the leadership of our colleague, judge and distinguished professor of criminal justice and criminology, Judge Ireland for convening this series of forums together with so many of you on this call today. I am confident that this multi institutional convocation will inform the conversation about criminal justice reforms. It is also designed to provide support to those courageous reformers you will hear from and to create further networks of support. So again, thank you for allowing me to say a few words and it is now my honor to turn the microphone over to the director of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Northeastern, Amy Farrell. Thank you so much, Dean Poiger, and welcome to all the participants of the 2021 convocation devoted to this very important topic of criminal justice reform. As the director of the School of Criminal Justice, I'm proud and grateful for the long relationships that the school has had with the Ruffin Society. I want to start off by acknowledging that it's been a challenging road in some ways to bring this convocation that will run across three weeks. 
Most of you may know that a version of this program originally scheduled to run a few weeks before the pandemic shut the world down um, made, made, us, made the Rough and Society change gears. And that was long before we conceived of choices between in-person, hybrid, or remote conferences. And here we are today. Since that time, not only has COVID upended our world, but the United States society has been brought to a historic period of reckoning about the role of our justice system in, system in longstanding racial disparities and the devastating consequences of unequal systems of justice across our communities. Since the origin of the Ruffin Society in 1984 and its partnership with the College of Criminal Justice under the leadership of then Dean Norm Rosenblatt, for those of you who remember Norm fondly, and Associate Dean Bob Crowati, our local and national criminal justice systems have changed dramatically. The work of the Ruffin Society to promote the advancement of professionals of color has been central to the changing of the justice system, both from the inside and the providing of critique and redirection from the outside. And we too have a school has changed over that time. Today's students at Northeastern University flock to the study of criminology and criminal justice in record numbers, in part because they are hungry to be part of conversations about reforms that will make our systems of justice more fair and equal and better for our communities. Today's programs and the programs in the coming week furthers and deepens our conversations about the role of the justice system in society, and I know will provide rich food for thought about the potential of true and meaningful reform. To those of you who made today's events possible, I would like to thank you. And I want to send a special thanks to Professor Jack McDevitt, former Dean Bob Crowati, and in particular, I want to thank Judge Rick Ireland, our distinguished professor of the practice, for your leadership and commitment to this program and the continued advancement of the Ruffin Society. Enjoy today's events. Thank you, Dean Poiger, and thank you, Director and Professor Farrell. And with that, I will now introduce our keynote speaker for today, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the Honorable Kimberly Budd. Her appointment to that position in 2020, after sitting as an Associate Justice on that bench since 2016, was historic as she became the first woman of color to serve as Chief Justice in the court's 329 year history. The chief is a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School. And I take judicial notice that she and former President Barack Obama were classmates. Her postgraduate portfolio includes positions held as law clerk to the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court, litigation associate at Mintz Levin, assistant United States attorney for the District of Massachusetts, university attorney for Harvard University, director of the Community Values Program at Harvard Business School, and associate justice of the Massachusetts Superior Court. We are honored to have her join us today, Chief Justice Budd. Good afternoon. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to join you for the Ruffin Society's Convocation on Criminal Justice Reform. I'd like to thank Chief Justice Rick Ireland and Convocation Co-Chairs Bob Ward and Fred Deschel for inviting me to speak. I also wanna thank all those who contributed to putting together this important event. George Lewis Ruffin was an extraordinary trailblazer. He was the first African-American to graduate from Harvard Law School, the first African-American to serve on the equivalent of the Boston City Council, and the first African-American judge in the United States. At each step of his amazing career, he faced overwhelming odds against him, and yet, he moved forward. Today, we need the same kind of resoluteness as we seek to solve the painfully persistent problem of racial inequity in our criminal justice system. We stand at a critical juncture in a long and troubling relationship between criminal justice and racial justice. On the one hand, we've seen some significant progress in recent years. Over the last decade, scholars have exposed the ways in which the legal system has imposed a regime of mass incarceration 
across the United States that has had devastating effects on communities of color. In some places, legislators have begun to dismantle some of the laws that supported that regime. In some instances, a new generation of prosecutors has begun to think critically about how best to exercise their discretion in making charging decisions. And in some cases, courts have begun to pay closer attention to the racial and ethnic inequities that persist in our criminal justice system, undermining the promise of equal justice for all. Certainly, we have seen some of that progress here in Massachusetts. The criminal justice reform legislation enacted in 2018 took steps to reduce incarceration in the Commonwealth, including decriminalizing some offenses, eliminating or narrowing some mandatory minimum sentences, and expanding opportunities for diversion. A study released earlier this year by Suffolk County District Attorney Rachel Rollins showed that decisions not to prosecute people for low-level crimes actually made it less likely that they would commit another offense in the following two years. And the court on which I sit, the Supreme Judicial Court, has issued a number of decisions in the last several years presenting a clear-eyed view of the role that race plays in encounters between police and the public. For example, in an opinion authored by Je Justice Jerry Hines in 2016, the court acknowledged in Commonwealth versus Warren that black men in the city of Boston are more likely to be targeted for police encounters, citing studies by the Boston Police Department and the American Civil Lib Liberties Union of Massachusetts. The court observed that given this fact, a black man's efforts to evade a police encounter might just as easily be motivated by the desire to avoid the recurring indignity of being racially profiled as by the desire to hide criminal activity. And the court held that this fact should be considered in weighing whether a black man's flight from an officer gives rise to a reasonable suspicion that he has committed a crime. Last year in Commonwealth versus Long, we acknowledged that police top, stop drivers of color disproportionately more often than Caucasian drivers for insignificant violations or for no reason at all. The court also recognized that requiring statistical evidence of selective enforcement of traffic laws placed an unfair burden on defendants in light of the lack of data. And we made it easier for defendants to demonstrate that a stop involved racial profiling. Warren, Long, and other related decisions build upon the foundation previously laid by our predecessors on the court. Back in 1999, for example, Chief Justice Ireland highlighted the problem of racial profiling in Commonwealth versus Gonzales. And in 2008, in Commonwealth versus Laura, he presciently questioned whether the statistical proof of discriminatory policing discussed in that opinion would prove too difficult for defendants to collect. So yes, we have seen some progress recently, but at the same time, the repeated tragic and unjustified deaths of black men and women in police encounters across the country are a stark reminder that we continue to fall short of our ideals as a nation. And here in Massachusetts, the Harvard Law School study that was released last year has focused our attention on the racial and ethnic disparities that still pervade our Commonwealth's criminal justice system. Here, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of another one of my predecessors, Chief Justice Ralph Gantz. One of his greatest qualities was his willingness to confront the shortcomings of our justice system. He commissioned the Harvard study in 2016 after seeing sentencing commission data showing rates of imprisonment for African-Americans and Hispanics were significantly greater than for whites in Massachusetts, and that this disparity was significantly worse in Massachusetts than the national average. In response to that data, he said that we need to learn the truth behind this troubling disparity. And once we learn it, we need the courage and the commitment to handle the truth. When the Harvard study was finally released last September, just days before Chief Justice Gantz's untimely death, he welcomed it, calling it a must read that would provide us with important guidance as we work to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in the Massachusetts criminal justice system. The Harvard study concluded that black and Latinx people 
were overrepresented in the criminal caseload compared to their population in the state, and that Black and Latinx people were given longer sentences than their similarly situated white counterparts. The reason for these sentencing disparities are complex, and they go beyond what happens in the courtroom. The Harvard study concluded that Black and Latinx defendants tend to, tend to receive more severe initial charges than white defendants for similar conduct. And those charges often involve mandatory minimum sentences. These racially disparate initial charging practices in turn lead to Black and Latinx defendants finding themselves in weaker positions in the plea bargaining process. And ultimately, they result in longer sentencing sentences than for whites for similar offenses. We clearly have much more work to do. As the justices of the SJC said in an open letter to the bench and bar last year after the murder of George Floyd, as members of the legal community, we need to re-examine why too often our criminal justice system fails to treat African-Americans the same as white Americans and recommit ourselves to the systemic change needed to make quality under the law an enduring reality for all. It's going to take all of us working together in our respective fields to truly realize the promise of equal justice for all. Police officers working to stop racial profiling, prosecutors reviewing their charging practices, legislators revising mandatory minimum sentencing laws, judges guarding against implicit bias in the courts, and all of us working to identify and address systemic problems. Within the court system, we've made this work a top priority. We've begun convening quarterly meetings of the chief justices of each court and the commissioner of probation to discuss what our courts are currently doing and to share proposals for new plans to combat to combat racial and ethnic inequities. To take one example, the district court has been working with the Plymouth County District Attorney's Office in Brockton to create a pilot program that gives an assistant district attorney an opportunity to review criminal charges prior to the clerk magistrate deciding whether to authorize the complaint. By reviewing the charges prior to the clerk magistrate's determination, the ADA can identify any potential charging issues and suggest suitable candidates for diversion before arraignment or the issuance of a complaint. During the first week of the pilot, of the 14 summons and show cause applications that the district attorney's office reviewed, the ADA recommended diversion in three cases. And in two of those cases, the accused was identified as black. The ADA also recommended that the charges be reduced in two other cases. And in one of those cases, the accused was also identified as black. The district court is hoping to expand this pilot program to other jurisdictions in the future. As we move forward, we hope to generate more new ideas. And I would like to take this opportunity to ask all of you for your input. If you have a suggestion as to how the courts can promote equity in our criminal justice system more effectively, please feel free to reach out to my office. As I've said before, this is a complicated problem and we need everyone's best ideas. Combating inequities in our criminal justice system has been a long, challenging, and often discouraging battle. It sometimes seems that despite the progress we have made, the road to our goal remains endless. But we have come as far as we have only because others before us, like George Lewis Ruffin, refuse to be discouraged in the face of often daunting odds. And we owe it to the next generation that we will do no less for them. Thank you for all that you do. And thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this important convocation. Thank you so much, Chief Justice Bud. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our convocation facilitator, Christine Cole. Executive Director of the Crime and Justice Institute, a division of Community Resources for Justice. 
Recognized as an authority and expert in criminal justice policy and management, she has engaged in safety and justice reform work with governments and international multilateral agencies in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and South Pacific. We are honored to have her join us today. Christine Cole, welcome. Thank you so much, Chief Ireland. Uh, it's truly an honor to be here. I guess we're not here, but we're together for this Rough and Society conversation, convoca convocation and conversation. It's a great privilege to facilitate this panel of extraordinary women. I had to get that in, ladies. I hope that's okay. Um, of extraordinary women, but also to be with inspiring, dedicated criminal justice reformers like Chief Justice Ireland and what we just heard from Chief Justice Budd is truly remarkable. Uh, thanks for what each of you have done and continue to do in your professional and probably your personal lives too to address some of the inequities that we've heard about today, but things that, that, that we, you more than I perhaps live every day, but we, we see it, we own it, and the work continues, we need to fix it. I wanna reserve as much time as possible for the forthcoming discussion. So introductions of the panelists will be brief. Uh, their bios are extensive, they're impressive, and they're available on the website. Their accomplishments and successes, and probably challenges too, are many. So I hope that we can get started. I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction of each of our panelists before we start the conversation. Uh, Rachel Rollins is the elected district attorney for Suffolk County, Massachusetts. She's the first woman of color to hold that position. And as somebody who lives in the greater Boston area, I can say that um, she somewhat created a storm with some with her policy memo released in 2019. This, in this document, DA Rollins set the tone for a new office culture, changing the way the Suffolk DA's office would do business. The memo, among other topics, addresses pretrial detention and bail, charging decisions, addresses collateral consequences and the importance of thinking about them, uh, talks about community engagement, ethics, ethics and integrity, and restoring trust. All things that seem like no-brainers. And yet, um, as I said, she kind of started a storm with that policy memo. Also elected DA, we have Satana DeBerry here. She ran on a platform for a fairer and safer Durham and culture change saying, quote, we deserve better. As the elected district attorney for Durham County, North Carolina, she promised during her campaign, oh, excuse me, um, <laughs> her approach to reform emphasizes using common sense to guide decisions, addressing racial bias, and building a stronger relationship between the people of Durham and the criminal justice system. I see some similarities in both of those district attorneys, and they are they are different from the same old, same old. And, and it's exciting to have both of you on this panel. Our third panelist is Andrea Cabral. Andrea currently serves on the State Cannabis Control Advisory Board. She's the Chief Executive Office Officer of Ascend Massachusetts. And some of you may know her by voice as she's a regular commentator and legal expert for Boston's WGBH public radio station. Her past criminal justice roles include a term as Secretary of Public Safety and elected Sheriff of Suffolk County, Massachusetts. Again, the first woman of color to hold that position. Andrea's appointments to the Sheriff's role followed a report calling for wide sweeping reform in that department. None of these women are adverse to reform, adverse to change, and are leaders themselves in what they do. So thank you. Um, if we were together, I'd say join me in welcoming them all here. It's really uh, great to have you all together. So thank you. As we all know, we're here together in part to honor, honor George Lewis Ruffin. We've heard about him from our prior speakers 
a leader, a first in so many ways. I feel so inspired by his work and his legacy. Among his other accomplishments, as we heard from Chief Justice Budd, he was elected to the Boston City Council in 1875. I'd love to hear from each of you what motivated you to run for elected office. I'll start with Andrea. Uh, I know you were appointed as sheriff first, but you didn't have to run and yet you chose to do so. Tell us what inspired you to run for office. Uh, it was basically the only way I could do the job because, because it's an elected office. Um, I knew that it would take approximately six years in order to take the office from where it was to where it, it needed to be, um, or to at least put it on a footing where uh, a lot of the uh, abuses and mismanagement could be eliminated and it would have you know, a fighting chance going forward to treat people decently um, and to really exercise the kind of role that community correction should have uh, in our society versus the role that it was playing at the time that I took over. Um, so for me, running was a necessary evil. I did not set out to be an elected official or to be involved in, in politics at all. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very good education around, um, in some cases, the cognitive dissonance between uh, elections and governance. Uh, there is one way that one gets elected. It's, you know, what one does once one, one is in office is entirely different. Uh, and I must say, I enjoyed the latter much more than the former, but that was really what it was. I wanted very badly to do that job and I needed to be elected in order to do it. That's great, thank you. Satana, so, you've had a career as a public defender um, and a, a successful one among many other things that you've done in your career. Tell us what inspired you not only to run for office, but be, to become the DA of Durham County. And I'll invite all three of you to, to keep your microphones um, off mute so that we can jump in and have a conversation when the time is right for that. Great, uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here with you all today. I wasn't a public defender, I was a criminal defense attorney. So there's a, you know, there's a little there's bit- There's a difference, difference. thank <laughs> you. There absolutely is a difference. Um, but you know, I had spent most of my career doing advocacy for poor people, uh, people of color, communities of color. And um, some folks that I've worked with over the years in my community came to me and said they'd been working on criminal legal system reform for about a decade and had started to see real inroads in the judiciary and with law enforcement, um, but always seemed to get stopped at the district attorney's door. And the district attorney didn't really want to hear what the community needed or how people felt about prosecution and what was happening to folks in their community. And I knew for my advocacy work, um, doing housing, affordable housing work and community economic development work that um, involvement in the criminal legal system really sets you up for failure in almost every other system um, in the United States. And so uh, they came and asked me to run, they had to ask me a few times because as a former criminal defense attorney, um, the idea of being a prosecutor was one of the last things that I ever thought I would do. Um, <clears throat> but I saw that uh, folks like Kim Fox and Marilyn Mosby uh, uh, were changing how, we, how Americans do prosecution and, and how we think about prosecution yeah. and uh, decided to jump in the race and was luckily, lucky enough to be elected in 2018 with my good friend, Rachel Rollins. And uh, we have been working on those goals of, you know, really decreasing the number of people who come into contact with the criminal legal system um, for anything other than serious and violent issues. Yeah, there was a crop of you, wasn't there, around the same time. And there were so many women of color um, in particular, and also women that just made it so exciting as uh, um, somebody who watches the criminal justice system and these races. Uh, Rachel, you, forgive me, may I use your first names? Is that you right? Bet. You Great. bet, that's totally fine. Thank you. Um, I've known Andrea a long time, but I've not, um, I, I don't have that degree of uh, uh, contact with either of you, so thank you. Uh, Rachel, you were, you were working in, uh, 
as a, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, and you decided to throw your hat in the ring. Uh, I suspect for some of the same reasons we've heard, but let's hear it from you personally. What inspired you to to take that leap? I have the unique privilege of feeling like I've seen the criminal legal system from every angle. I have a father who was a corrections officer, uncles who've served decades in the Mass State Police, other uncles and great uncles that have served in local police departments, um, deep respect for the military and law enforcement. I also have siblings and people I love that have unfortunately cycled in and out of the criminal legal system. And I think you need somebody that isn't a true believer in either of those, right? Like the system is 100% wrong and there's nothing good about it, or there's absolutely nothing wrong with our system and it's perfect, right? Somebody sort of in the middle to say, look, nobody's perfect, right? Nothing is perfect. There's not a single industry or profession where they get it right 100% of the time. So I started with that kind of base and then honestly, I was just tired of, of turning on my TV and seeing situation after situation after situation, not necessarily in Boston, but across the country where communities that pay taxes, that are entitled to you know, uh, law enforcement protecting and serving them as well, not getting the same bang for their buck, right? That other more affluent communities get from the police, from the district attorney's office, from the government writ large. And I said, rather than sitting alone in my living room yelling at the television, I was gonna actually stand up and try to do something about it. So I, at the ripe age of 46, 47 almost, I said, I'm gonna run for office. There had never been a woman of any color to ever be DA in the history of Suffolk County. And uh, there is somebody on this panel that has worked in that office um, herself. And there has never been a woman of color to ever be DA in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So there were multiple ceilings and shards of glass broken. Um, similarly, when DA Harrington out in Berkshire County became the first woman ever to win in her district uh, or you know, uh, county. So, I decided to run and I decided to try and think creatively about solutions from the inside because we need criminal defense attorneys, we need activists, we need adjutants, but they're on the outside looking, trying to look in and understand when you are leading an office, it's much easier to set policies with the autonomy that DAs have. You know, you all, um... You all nodded, um, or you all, Santana and um, Andrea, you both nodded, nodded when Rachel said she was sick of watching things on TV. Um, and I, I share that. Um, it's been so discouraging over these last handful of years. It seems to have intensified. I know a little bit about the, the DAs, um, the group who have been called innovators. And uh, it, I, I get the sense that you all support each other and help each other through some of these difficult times. One of the things that seems to be consistent among you, and, and Andrea, I'm not trying to exclude you from this, so please jump in, is the use of data. Um, and, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit more. I find it really interesting how um, you've all used it uh, in, in your work. And Andrea, I think about your current work on the, the advisory board, perhaps using data. But how is that? I think about your report too, Rachel. How are you using data to tell stories, to make changes um, with, without um, and inspire people to pay attention to the changes that need to happen? Oh, Anna, do you first. want to start? Yeah, right. sure. I will go first on that. Um, so, you know, typically prosecutors' offices are black boxes. Nobody knows what happens um, until something rolls out. And generally, prosecutors have been judged on convictions. And one of the things that, you know, I come from a nonprofit background. And uh, when you run a nonprofit and you ask other people for money, they want to know what you're doing with their money, right? You're constantly reporting on it. You're constantly telling them what your metrics are, what you're trying to achieve. And so I brought some of that to this office. Also, this is, you know, 
we want for our community to know what we're doing because we want them to think it's fair, right? A big issue around criminal legal, the criminal legal system is that a lot of Americans just do not think they are treated fairly. They don't think people who look like them are treated fairly. They don't think people who have the same issues that they have are treated fairly. Um, you know, back to what, what Rachel said, you know, they feel like they're taxpayers. They live in this community. They contribute to it. They want to be treated fairly and they want to, and they want the transparency of it. And so what data does, it is allows us to, it allows me to do um, a couple things. One, as a manager, it allows me to understand exactly what we're doing, right? Who do we prosecute? Why do we prosecute them? Do um, assistant district attorneys in my office prosecute the same people at the same rate with the same thing? Are, are our plea offers, um, do, do we offer the same plea offices across offense class, across race, across, across socioeconomic status? Um, and then also, you know, in my role, kind of uh, Andrea made a, a point about being um, uh, running for office as opposed to running the yeah. office, right? Then as my role as the leader of this office, being able to say to my community, um, hey, we recognize this, right? Um, maybe we have, we have issues, certainly we have issues around prosecuting people of color. One of the things that we learned when we started gathering data in my office that 100% of our juvenile caseload was African-American, 100%. Um, and while you may know that anecdotally because you're sitting in the courtroom, it's not something that the ADA thinks about every day as cases are coming in. And so as the leader, I am able to say, there are these systemic problems or these systemic issues uh, across prosecution right, that we need to have a conversation about. Yeah. Um, and the data makes that possible. Andrea, you looked at appropriately horrified by that statement that Satana just made about 100% of the juveniles in the office are people of, are, are youth of color. Um, it makes me think about the, the pathways to the DA's office. And um, you, you can take important steps in in changing your own trajectory, but you can't you, you can't manage all these ancillary systems that that bring you some of the the the, the people the cases that you get. Um, Andrea, talk about your reaction a little bit, or how that might imp how we can think about uh, changing different trajectories. So that's not the case. The data are so important. What do we do with it now? Well. I was a prosecutor for 16 years, um, uh, all but three of which uh, were in the DA's office in Middlesex first, and then under Ralph Martin, who was actually the first black male DA in Suffolk County history. Um, so I'll, I'll try to weave in a little bit of the historical perspective on this. It was, it was considered revolutionary when Ralph told prosecutors to get out of the courtrooms and into the communities. And that's where the, the uh, community prosecutions the, and, and uh, having prosecutors in police stations at the time, not formally sort of looking over the shoulder at um, police reports and looking at complaints, but sort of informally doing that and then developing the safe neighborhood initiatives. Those things had never been done to your earlier point and, and to Satana's point about it being a black hole, nobody ever questioned what was going on in a DA's office. Certainly not like they do now with, you know, having to go up to ways and means and sort of justifying how you, how you spend your budget. And it was pure, almost entirely discretionary. And that hit a lot of things. Um, but you look at when Ralph Martin left in 1998 to when uh, Rachel came in and, you know, a lot of that stuff went by the wayside in the interim. And Rachel not only picked it up, she, she, she leaped it to the next to the next level, um, but but you know what I would say is that, and I used to use this a lot when I would train uh, district court DAs. Uh, I was uh, chief of district courts when I was in the DA's office, and I would tell them it doesn't feel like it, but you are the most powerful person in this courtroom, yep. and you have to remember that. And even when you're new, you have to remember that. And you have to have the courage to challenge the probation department and to even challenge the judge 
but you also have to learn how to exercise your discretion, challenge your supervisor if you think that, that there's something happening that shouldn't be happening. And I wasn't charging them with creating the kind of massive systemic change that was well beyond their ken as district court prosecutors. What I was trying to make them understand is that you are surrounded by other people in this courtroom, including defendants who have families who are entitled to fairness. And you cannot go wrong trying to be fair, objecting to things that you don't believe are fair. But the way the system is set up, prosecutors, and especially in district court, and especially when they're new, are made to feel as though they are the least powerful people in the room. Everybody yells at them. Cops yell at them. Probation officers yell at them. Judges yell at them. And I think part of it is imbuing them with some sense of ownership beyond the need to get through those that stack of cases every single day so that they, they are more of a part of it. And I think what DA Rollins and uh, DA DeBerry do it, it, with the overall way that they run their offices and the specific way that they train their DAs, because I, I, I was doing the Suffolk uh, uh, trainings for a while there, they do give them that and they feel as though the leadership is from the top down and that they are empowered. And I can't stress enough how important that is, that level of leadership is. Yeah, and I just want to say quickly to that, right? I tell my ADAs, they work for me, right? They don't work for the judge. They don't work for law enforcement. They work for me. And so we are pushing through our values, what we think is important in court. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is a level of um, freedom and discretion, I think, that's necessary for there to be fairness. Right. Yeah, I, I would love yeah. to, to jump in there, right? So and to what was said, the ADAs are usually the youngest people in the courtroom, right? So remember, assistant district attorneys, you can get that job the day you graduate from law school. Or if you're 303 certified, you haven't even graduated from law school. And there are judges, I've sat on the JNC, the Judicial Nominating Commission, you need at least 10 years of legal experience before you can be a judge, right? police officers. So adding to all of that pressure is you are the youngest person in the room, the judge, you know, oh, your honor, I need a few minutes. Look at it right now. You don't have any time. And what I've said to my ADAs is then tell them your honor. And, and I said, and you know, I will, both of these two women know <laughs> that I will do this. I'll show up and argue it for you. Tell him your, or usually him, but her or them, your honor, then you can move forward with this proceeding without the Commonwealth. We are going off the record. I need to check and shepherdize this case, right? Because there's no phone service in most of the courtrooms. We're not rushing to do this, right? This isn't about the judges, Your Honor. Judge Ireland, we love and respect you, but this is not about the judges' schedule and whether they need to get home. For We serve the people, right? the judges work for the, the Commonwealth as well. And it shouldn't be about, well, but I don't like doing things. You know, it's hilarious. I have judges that at 901 and, you know, Andrea, you, Andrea, you know this, right? Like it, it, 901 default. I have other judges, you're there at 845, they stroll out at 1030. You can't default a judge, but it's just, and I get it, things happen, but there, there's, it's wishy-washy about by the luck of the draw, what judge you get, what prosecutor you get, what public defender or criminal court appointed lawyer you get, who your probation officer. I hate that. And what I tried to do as the DA is say, here's our policy. I'm saying it out loud. I'm writing it down and now I'm posting it. So that if you are the child of a Rockefeller or Rachel Rollins, who isn't, right? No matter who you can afford, whether you can go to Ropes and Gray and get a $2,000 an hour lawyer to represent you, or whether you have a public defender, you have the same percentage likelihood of success, irrespective of your wealth and privilege and entitlement, right, to the system, whether you know the clerk, whether you know the DA or anyone else. And I will just add, sadly, that 100% of, you know, young people or juvenile, I think cases you said of color in Suffolk County, in my juvenile cases, it's 95% are black and brown boys. 
And tellingly, there's not a single black male juvenile judge in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts right now, right? And this fantastic um, Justice Ireland used to be one. And so did, you know, uh, Judge Harris, for example, Leslie Harris. But imagine what it feels like to walk into court and, you know, to the white people on this call, close your eyes and try to walk through this you know, without laughing, white officer found guilty by an all black jury. Like you can't even get the words out of your mouth because your mind can't even comprehend an all black jury. If I told you how many all white jury murder convictions we are looking at right now in cross racial homicides, defendants black, you know, victim is white. Is that a jury of your peers, right? So again, I, I know we're talking about a lot of different things. The last thing I will say that I say to my ADAs all the time, is when I came up with my list of 15, I don't want lawlessness. I want my limited resources focused on violent, serious crimes. That's what I want, one. And two, in white affluent communities, when kids shoplift, and uh, as a 1989 graduate of Buckingham Brown and Nichols School in Cambridge, newsflash, white kids shoplift, <laughs> if people don't know that, right? And we go to the W towns, Weston, Wabin, Winchester, Wellesley, Okay, you know what? The police aren't arresting them. They call their parents, right? Or they give them a stern talking to and send them home. Or when they're underage drinking, and again, class of 89, Buckingham, Brown and Nichols, affluent kids underage drink all the time. The police pour their beers out, send them home, drive them home themselves. And those kids go on to graduate from an IF ISL school, you know, Varsity Blues their way into, I'm joking, right? The Varsity Blues case is going on right now, but you know, apply appropriately to an Ivy League school or something else and end up being fine. But in communities of color and poor communities, white poor communities, we don't get the same benefit. So we have to start thinking differently about those situations. Thanks, you've raised a number of such important topics, disparate treatment, opportunity, the other system players, I want to hone in on some of those, but first let's talk a little bit about the diversion and discret excuse me, the discretion that first Satana brought up and then you, Rachel, a little bit talking about your staff. I, you know, I've met prosecutors across the country who say, you know, we take what we get. We prosecute the cases that come before us. And you both are intimating that that doesn't have to be the way it happens. Speak more about that, if you will. Rachel, I'd love to hear from you when you give this, this authority to your assistant DAs and say, don't be pressured, take the time, <laughs> tell the judge, I'll come in there if you need me. How's that going? Like, has anybody invoked that? Has, well, has it changed practice in that first session that's madness? Well, you know, and, and I want to just remind people, I came from the U.S. Attorney's Office where there's three, four things on a judge's docket a day, article three judges, right? You walk in, there's like trumpets playing and two doves fly out and the judges read every single one of your pleadings, all of their clerks know everything. That's not what happens or, you know, uh, Madam Cabral, do you wanna tell them what BMC Central is like? You know, it's, it is really, really fast paced movement, right? We don't know what cases we're dealing with sometimes, because when we come in Monday morning, there's a pile, you know, three times bigger than this of all the arrests that happened the weekend before that or what have you. So, you know, this sort of attitude of we take what we get, let's take a step back. The police arrest where they are oftentimes. And I am all for the police being in communities that have high part one violent crimes. But what I'm not for is them making arrests for nonviolent, non-serious mm -hmm. crimes that do nothing to keep us safer, as opposed to the kidnappings, armed assault with intent to murder, rape, child sexual assaults, homicides, right? If you were knocking on these doors for those cases, I would be out there with the billboard advocating for you to get right. more overtime. What I don't want is you getting overtime for crimes that don't keep us safe, right? That are just Agreed. stats that you can use to get numbers. And just because we can, doesn't mean we must. Of course not. I say this to them all the time. So my question was, um, I, I, think, I think certainly I am. I expect the others are in agreement with what you've just said. 
I'm curious, when I hear we take what we get, I wonder about how you apply the discretion to that list of we take what we get. Because when you look at um, some of the folks that are before you in custody or under arrest, do you really need to prosecute everybody that you see? Or to you, Satana, when you have that, that docket, uh, how are your assistant DAs allowed to use their discretion and maybe not prosecute some of those cases? Yeah, and, and I have to say, before I get started, I always feel low energy when I'm on a, uh, in, on a panel with Rachel Rollins. <laughs> I feel like, my God, I'm not doing enough. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so I mean, the discretion is a big part of it, right? I'm not in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm no. in the state of North Carolina. And in the state of North Carolina, district attorney is a constitutional officer with a hundred percent discretion on what moves forward into court. And so we talk about that a lot in our office. Um, like Rachel, we have a list of things that are low priority, right? And we know those things do not lead to serious crime. We know that smoking a joint in the park is not gonna make you peeing in somebody's yard, is not gonna make you come back and kill them tomorrow. Right. right? And so this is not um, this is not rocket science. It is also not unknowable. Right? We know what things, there's lots of research, there's lots of evidence. It seems like public safety is one of the few places in America where you can bring evidence and research to show something and people go, yeah, no, I don't believe that. Right, like I, they pee in my yard, they'll kill me, right? So we bring research-based, evidence-based decision-making, especially to our district courts, right? Um, like you, our district courts, like Rachel said, you come in, it is a million things at one time. It is our most inexperienced lawyers. Um, and it is, it's, and it, these are life-changing decisions that they make. And so we, we talk about that a lot. Um, and we use, like Rachel says, we use our limited resources for the most serious things. And what that means is not just constantly talking to the community about that, although the community knows that, right? Those folks who are defendants are also the people who are victims. Right? There's no getting away from that. Right. There's no, you know. I say this a lot, the dirty little secret of the criminal justice system is not only are all the defend are all the defendants black and brown, but all the victims are too. Right. And so we try to make sure that we we keep in mind like what is in the best interest of our community, what is in Rachel, you know, used it was a really uh, great example to use kind of high school kids drinking and Right. The difference between going home, right, and having to defend a misdemeanor or a felony charge. Um, and so we, the way that we keep, we just constantly talk about this office. And we constantly keep that discretion in front of us. It is a powerful position. And I think when I, when I was running, you know, I kind of knew it because, right, I've been a criminal defense attorney. I've seen how prosecutors, you know, treat criminal defendants as well as their counsel. Um, and, and when I first took this job, I kind of knew it. But now, after having been in this position for uh, almost three years, uh, I am very fully aware of the power that the prosecutor brings to bear. Nothing gets in that courtroom unless we allow it in that courtroom. And we, we think about that before we do anything. And think about the real impact that it has on our community, not just from not prosecuting, which is what people, you know, want to talk about me and Rachel and, the, you know, they're like, oh, you're not prosecuting that. What are the real consequences of people in our community when we do prosecute things? All right. And who do we want held accountable um, and who really keeps us unsafe? And so constantly having. And, and then just to add to that and, and, quickly. It's just all we're doing is sort of switching the presumption. There's no bright line rule. It's just from, and, and again, DA Martin, I don't think was interested in stats of like how many, you know, Larson, like how, how many vagrancy like 
crimes can we prosecute in order to look like we're doing our job well? I just think it's important that we we frame it that way. I'm sorry, I just interrupted you. No, no. <laughs> no, I was going to, I just wanted to jump in to say, so the deluge comes to the DA's office, right? And in, in the Commonwealth, it's a little bit different. Police are making obviously reasonable suspicion decisions and probable cause decisions. They're seeking the complaints. The complaints are issued uh, out of the clerk's office and they're there waiting for the district court ADA when they get in in the morning. And the DA makes a decision, generally speaking, once the complaint is already issued. That means that person is already in the system. They will either appear or, they, or if they don't appear, a default warrant will issue, but that case is now live and in the system and it will stay there until sealed or expunged. I think, and, I, and I, that's entirely appropriate. I think what we're trying to do here is have the person or the, the entity that is responsible ultimately for prosecuting that case get an opportunity. That's what the, the Plymouth County DA's office uh, pilot program is about that Chief Justice Budd referenced. Make, make it possible for those that are ultimately gonna have the responsibility the burden of going forward and the burden of, of, of uh, proof, let them have a look at that complaint, compare it to the report, see if it actually is probable cause based or is otherwise non-meritorious in terms of the goals of protecting public safety. And I'll tell you that that, that program that Plymouth is doing now, that originated in the 90s. The trial court was, was uh, in favor of it, of having prosecutors do it. It got kind of wrapped up in this computer IT overhaul, tens of millions of dollars later, we don't have the computer overhaul and the program never actually happened, but it cost taxpayers uh, a great deal of money. But what I would say is before the deluge, right? Fundamentally, the system operates too frequently on who is perceived to be a criminal and a threat and who is not who is perceived to have, quote unquote, their whole life ahead of them and who is not. I cannot tell you the number of times judges um, very sort of subconscious, not well consciously said it, but subconsciously didn't seem to understand what it really meant, would say that when it was a, a white defendant and you would never hear it if it was a black defendant. And the reason that the deluge stops at the door of the prosecutor, the reason that the deluge exists is based on everything that comes before it from the time that black or brown person steps outside their house to the time they are perhaps in an encounter with a police officer and they are perceived to be a greater threat than they are based on their race. And that's the larger, bigger issue. And, it's, and it is significant because that's what led to the lynching of George Floyd in broad daylight. Right. And, and, and I'll just add, we have to call that out when it's happening in our office. So I'll never forget and not, you know, it's a teachable moment, right? We had an overdose death that the press release was written and the person was described as a promising life lost. And when this overdose death happened, we had had 50, maybe 60 homicides, very few white, never described as the victim as promising. Right. And, you know, again, I with with substance use, there are complicated factors there, but um, the individual that lost their life had broken into a car and was arrested by the police. There was no mention whatsoever of the sort of what happens with black and brown youth and people generally of I'm a victim of a crime, but they put up a photo of me for, that's like you know, a, a mug shot and people don't know the difference of like, wait, is that the victim or what did this person do? Which of course has to do with the way the media portrays different communities and other things like that. But I guess we have to take that moment to have the uncomfortable conversation and say, help me understand what's promising about this person and what wasn't about these other people. And that doesn't mean we then fire whoever did it, but we then have the discussion about implicit bias that we do. And, you know, again, I know people always accuse me of like, oh my God, all she does is talk about wealth and race and people are more uncomfortable talking about race than they are really about wealth. But, and I just said, well, because there's, name me another place 
where there's more black representation and not in leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Like period at all. Um, you're, so, you, no, you're absolutely right. And I think about I think about the prior conversation when you were talking about um, neighborhoods that are over policed. I think about the deluge that Andrea says of cases that come into you. Um, we are in a moment, as you've all said, where the the you, we can't talk about criminal justice reform without talking about racial justice. Nor should we. Nor should we. Right. Um, the, the question I have for you, because you've all talked about community involvement and engagement too, which I dare say is very different than the district attorney's office I worked in uh, decades ago. It's just not part of the norm that I was accustomed to then to have the degree of community engagement that you've all talked about. How, how do you, in the spirit of George Ruffin, bring together this community that's been over-policed, miscategorized, overrepresented in every part of the system, except in leadership, as you so eloquently said. How are you, how are you helping to bring together this criminal legal system with this community when there's demonstrated bias, when there's this lack of trust, when there's this experience of injustice? What are we doing about that? You all talk about community engagement. How is this coming together for you? Any of you can answer. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of give a, a bit of an historical um, uh, perspective. If you, once you have things like safe neighborhood initiatives, you have prosecutors, you have good community policing. And I will say that the, the Boston Police Department has made it a focus, has made community policing a focus. You begin to see communities not as objects to be policed, but as residential areas where the people who live there are entitled to the same level of public safety as anyone else, even if there is a, a higher crime rate in that area, and that they are entitled to take a hand in their own safety. That's essentially what a safe neighborhood initiative is, where, where law enforcement is not perceived as um, a bludgeon, but as a potential partnership to keep everyone in the neighborhood safe. And so I think, you know, it'll be very interesting to take some data measurements post, if we ever get to a point of post COVID, um, because I think this is gonna be a unique period in time where um, the degree to which we were engaging before COVID and our ability, how that has fallen by the wayside during COVID, I wanna see where the gap is that is gonna to need to be made up in that. Um, but people have become more cynical. Um, you know, every cell phone has a camera and that is the reason why we have begun to see what I think was always happening. Okay. It's now, as you know, as Will Smith famously said, it's not that it just started happening, it just started to be filmed. Um, and so people's, uh, the lack of trust, um, the mistrust, the hostility, all of that uh, in a post COVID era is really going to, those are, those are chickens that are going to come home to roost, I think in a big way. The flip side of that obviously is that I think there is more engagement. There is more activism around it because people have seen the most extreme examples of when uh, law enforcement goes wrong. And to the point that everyone has made on this panel, we're all very tired right. of watching you know, murder uh, you know, um, at the hands of law enforcement. And there is also time to encourage and support law enforcement that gets it, that works yeah. well, that works within the community. I mean, that's part of it we never talk about. Those are folks who feel demoralized because of how they are perceived by the public and they're actually trying to do good work. And we, we seldom achieve that balance of creating the kind of meritocracy that encourages good work by the police and acknowledges it publicly because we have to spend so much time on all of the bad actors. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done and the community does have a role to play in that, but the re-engagement is going to have to happen very soon given the disengagement that we've seen during COVID. And, and I think what's beautiful about the George Floyd trial is how many members of law enforcement jumped up and said, I want to testify against him, right? Not in support of him, right? 
to say he is not us, right? This is not what we are and to vilify him. I find it fascinating too, because I Rodney King happened on my birthday. It was March 3rd, um, 1991, I, my 20th birthday. Um, I think a lot of people, that was the first time certain communities had ever seen things that other communities, poor communities of all color, and then a lot of BIPOC communities had been talking about forever. It was captured on video. OJ Simpson was another time when our country sort of came, came together or apart regarding really sort of visceral different reactions to a verdict. And what I can say is it is, at, you know, at least for me, the reaction was not necessarily in any way about not validating those two families that had to deal with the homicides of their loved one, but Mark Furman being exposed as the liar and the racist, everyone knows a Mark Furman, right? If, who, if you are poor and white or some other color and poor, or you're in a BIPOC community, back in those days, everyone knew a Mark Furman that was testa lying and no one ever questioned. They'd walked in, I love to use this and Ms. Cabral said it, cloaked in credibility, right? The police walk in cloaked in credibility when they, present to grand juries and trial juries on our behalf. And then I think the trifecta was George Floyd, where we have watched a nation, a world, watch an execution and, you know, ex exhausted is the right word, right? We are grateful for the verdict, but you know what we would have wished? We didn't need it, that George was alive and got to be charged with the misdemeanor of tendering a counterfeit $20 bill, right? Because what we're witnessing, witnessing is misdemeanor murders, which certain communities can't even comprehend. Because if I said to you, Christine, oh yeah, be careful, don't get killed on the way home because you have an air freshener hanging on your re rear view mirror and you're gonna be stopped and possibly shot as a result. Like there are people that are just like, what are you talking about? Is DA Rollins on drugs? That would never happen. Well, it does to our community, right? Right, right. And there were 30 years between those two incidents. And that's the other, right? When you say we wish he was alive and was possibly prosecuted for the misdemeanor of the counterfeit bill, we had 30 years of, of pain and sadness and agony. And, um, and, and that's why these conversations are so important, um, so important. I'd love to talk about what you're hearing from the community. Um, Satana, in your platform, you talked about bringing the community closer to the criminal justice system. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I'm not sure that's exactly the language, but it felt to me like building partnerships and extending the district attorney's office into neighborhoods in a way that was very new and different. Can you talk about that a little bit and how, what kind of responses you've had? Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, like Andrew said, COVID has disrupted so much of, of what we would have been doing um, in community, but I think one of the, the real goals for me was um, I want people to know who I am. And yeah. in, in lots of communities, people don't even know, not only they do not know what the district attorney does, they don't know who the district attorney is. They know who the district attorney is on law and order, <laughs> right? There are probably more people who can tell you who that, the name of the fictional Manhattan district attorney is, then can tell you the name. Adam of Schiff. Him. Sorry, yes. I think it's Adam Schiff or something like that. that. Was the, the original one. I don't know who it is now, but yeah, exactly. The fact that Rachel even remembers his name, right? Um, and so a big part of, of this for us has been transparency in our community, um, that people come, people feel comfortable coming up to me in the grocery store and complaining or talking about uh, what they felt did work or didn't work or what they feel the issue is. And so I think number one in any community, if you don't know who your police chief and your sheriff and your DA are, if you don't see those people regularly, if there's not a way for you to contact them, that's a problem, right? Because those people represent you and your community's values and, and um, they should be hearing from you. So what we, we do is we try to, in addition to providing, uh, my office does a, a bi-yearly, bi-annual report 
that talks about what we have done and what we continue to do. Um, we have held town halls where the community gets to directly ask me questions. Um, we run for one of the things that I uh, inherited was a backlog of um, homicide cases that had not been disposed of and families that were you know, kind of screaming for interaction. And so one of the things that we do now um, with the help of our community partners uh, is we hold a homicide family, uh, homicide victims family meeting every quarter. Um, our one for this quarter is Friday and we invite them in. We work with um, our community partner is the Religious Coalition for Nonviolent Durham. Um, they hold grief circles and kind of acknowledge uh, the victims of violence in our community. They co-host that with us. We sit with those families, answer whatever questions they may have, give them um, somebody to just, even if they just want to scream at somebody, yeah. right? Um, they have that opportunity to do that with me. We have community partners that work with us in restorative justice, in diversion, in data collection. Um, so extending out into the community uh, what we do and, and giving our community partners um, authority and oversight over or some of what are traditionally what would, would happen inside here. Great, thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience that I'm getting. Um, I want to invite you in the audience to ask, submit questions with the Q&A tool. I know that you've been prompted to do so. Um, one of the questions um, that I have, I'm going to start with you, Satana, because as if I recall correctly, North Carolina is a state where the judges aren't entirely appointed. Is that correct? Yes, they are all elected. They're all elected. And in Massachusetts, they're all appointed. Um, any of you can answer. We'll start with Satana. Do you have a sense of, of one system or another resulting in less disparity in sentencing? Uh, certainly with direct elections, the, the, the voting public has an opportunity to, to weigh in on who gets to be a judge. Um, and yet I worry sometimes that if they don't know who their DA is, they may not know who their judges are. Um, but do you, have you had any experience with looking at judges and sentencing disparities between elected yeah. or non-elected judges? Yeah, they definitely, people definitely don't know who the judges are. If they don't know who the DA is, they definitely have no idea who the judges are. Um, you know, I, I've been a member of the North Carolina Bar now for 27 years. Um, I have been a member of the bar when judges were appointed. And then uh, in 2010, when Republicans took over our General Assembly, they made all the judges elected, and not just elected, but um, part elected partisan. Used to be they were oh. elected, they didn't declare a party. Now those are partisan races, right? Um, so uh, does that change? Does that change? No. Right? The bias that lives in this system lives in us all. Yeah. Whether we are appointed or elected. And unless we are having that conversation, and North Carolina is a structured sentencing state, so there's only, um, really, really, as a prosecutor, I'm also deciding what the sentence is, right? Because 97% of our cases are resolved by plea bargaining. Um, so, right. do, and when judges are making uh, the decision about sentencing, do we see any difference? No. Rachel, if I remember your policy memo correctly, there's a section in there on, on plea bargains slash negotiations. What kind of directive are you giving your prosecutors around plea negotiations that's different maybe from your predecessors or takes into consideration some of your personal values and experiences that we've talked about today. So let's take COVID out of it where everything yeah. has like an 18 month added amount of time. But a lot of times people remember the collateral consequences of getting arrested and being detained if you can't afford your bail, you know, 
this isn't a vacation where you get three weeks to stay at the Suffolk County House of Corrections and catch up on your sleep or maybe work out a little bit, right? Like this is a huge disruption in people's lives that results in them losing their jobs, possibly losing their children, having a 51A filed against them, DCF involved in their life, all these other things. So people have different reasons for wanting to plea, you know, immediately to something where they might not even be guilty of, right? So we have had not one, but two enormous drug lab scandals in Massachusetts. We are known for many great things in our Commonwealth, but sadly, we are the state with the worst drug lab scandals in the United States of America, not one, but two of them, right? And then add to that for flavor, the Hinton drug lab, like mismanagement, which has been awful. And so what we're looking at is understanding with people or explaining to them when systems fail, right? The government doesn't get to benefit from our misconduct. And so what I say or teach with respect to plea bargains is just because somebody is desperate, right? Because they have to get out of jail. They, they want this to go away so they can you know, apply for that other job or not lose their housing or do something. They might not have all the evidence yet. We might not have even gotten all the evidence from the Boston Police Department or body worn cameras or footage or some other things. What I really want is to make sure anyone that accepts a plea fully understands any immigration consequences there might be. They fully understand, for example, let's say it's a breathalyzer. Um, Donna, in Massachusetts, we've had some really, um, you know, uh, we've had some breathalyzer tests that have been found to be, um, you know, uh, problematic, whereby certain breathalyzers, we have thrown out all of the testing regarding those specific tests. We need to make sure that these individuals are making informed decisions, right? And we are ministers of justice. A lot of people like to say to me and, and DA DeBerry, you know, oh, well, if you should be the public defender. It, no, <laughs> we are the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth includes the victim, the witnesses, the community, and guess who else it includes? The defendant. Yes, they get their own counsel, but I have to make decisions that are best for the Commonwealth. So I will say with please, we talk about all that. All of our new ADAs have to do a tour or you can't work, start working in court of the Suffolk County House of Corrections. If they have never set foot in the place where you go when you don't have bail and the sh former sheriff can explain to you whether that's Nashua Street or whether it's South Bay, but we get to see both of those locations in person before, but during COVID we're doing virtual tours. We have returning citizens speak to them, judges speak to them police officers speak to them, criminal defense attorneys, people with substance use disorder. They get trained by all of the people that they're actually going to be coming into contact with. That helps them better understand the parameters when we have all the power in the plea bargaining process because we have all the data and might not have turned everything over yet. That's great. That's a great strategy. One of the questions I have is, uh, and you've sort of um, started to answer it with, um, young DAs being often the newest, greenest attorneys being assigned to district courts, what, how might we improve training? And, and so some of those experiences, I think, start to answer that question. The rest of the question that I have from the audience is, do, does the panel have any thoughts on how to improve training to, it says, wash away implicit biased issues um, because they can hurt and ruin lives? This is a this is the, the, big, the big elephant in the room. This is what we've been talking about, about implicit bias and systemic bias and systemic racism, I think. What, what kinds of conversations or training are you doing in your offices about um, racism, implicit bias, um, white supremacy, anti-slavery kind of stuff? Sure, first, let me just say that we got to, you know, we have explicit bias that we have not addressed. <laughs> Forget all the implicit bias that people bring with them. Um, you know, part of implicit bias is just you just don't recognize that you have it. Right. Yeah. So are we we're not gonna get rid of that, right? Best we can do. And I think it's a lot, and it's not what people are doing now, is that we can train ourselves against our implicit bias. 
Um, we can know we have it. And so we're doing trainings here in my office around jury selection. Um, really one of the things we're learning from our data is whether or not we treat uh, defendants of the same race and socioeconomic status who are similarly situated the same. Um, and, that, and that we also talk about having ex implicit bias and how that impacts us. Um, there are you know, lots of um, suggestions on how we could rid the system of the implicit bias. One of the, the ones that has gained a lot of traction recently is um, not using peremptory challenges uh, and prosecutors banning the use of peremptory challenges in their offices. Uh, you know, I am an uh, old school litigator and a trial lawyer. As a trial lawyer, I believe if I have a good case, I should be able to convince any 12 people you put in the box. So I am, that is a solution that is particularly attractive to me. Um, I, but I know for some litigators, they think that being able to spend that, this is not, again, law and order where I don't know how it is in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but in the state of North Carolina, I'm not getting reams of information on jurors before I were picking them. And, you know, I'm making split second decisions on about whether I trust you or not. And so my implicit bias is running wide. Sure. Um, and so we talk about that. And, and even just talking about that, I, you know, I wanna say, we talk about what we're gonna do with juries and this, that, and the other. Most cases do not go to jury. That's right. The vet, I mean, at the at the very least, uh, in my in my jurisdiction, I could probably hold not talking about bench trials, I talk about, but talking about actual jury trials. The most jury trials I could probably have in a year is 150. Out of how many cases? Thirty thousand right. cases filed in my jurisdiction. Right, per year. That's not. 30,000 cases are sitting in my office right now. That's 30,000 cases a year that are being filed with maybe 150 being able to be tried. And that is maxed out, right? So um, so we've got to think, it's got, we've got to be way further back in the process than court. Well, and, and let me just, let me just ask this. So, you know, as a DA, an ADA who's tried cases in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, think about how many times with our jury questionnaire, for example, right, where we ask somebody sort of cryptically, have you ever been convicted of a crime or do you have charged with a crime? Lots of people, even lawyers, guys, right, believe that if it's dismissed, it's gone, right? Like, oh, I don't have a record. That was dismissed. It's like, no, no, no. When we run your quarry later, right, and again, the criminal defense bar, is very upset with my office right now. And I am in discussions with them because we run, we run the criminal records of the seated jurors prior to them being sworn. But what's interesting, and I believe the criminal defense bar has a point on this. We don't see if they're lying about anything else, right? We ask you, have you ever been the victim of a crime? We don't double check through our victim witness advocate, you know, database to see if Christine's lying about being the victim of a crime. We only ever think you're lying about, have you ever committed a crime? We don't check to see where you're lying with one of your relatives as a member of law enforcement. We don't check about any other lie, but this one. And this isn't even Rachel Rollins saying like, there's, you know, racial disparities in the criminal legal system. If we admit to the fact that police are stopping black drivers at significantly higher rates. Listen, my Irish family lives in West Roxbury. They are terrible drivers. And I love you, Uncle Paul, but you know, you're driving crazy on LaGrange Street, right? They just aren't stopped at the same rates right. that I am stopped in Roxbury, not West Roxbury, Roxbury, right? So if we look at who is charged with crimes, who is arrested by the police at higher rates and not given that discretion that is often used for, remember these shoplifters or underage drinkers? My dad, my white Irish father in South Boston and Charlestown and Roslindale and West Roxbury, how many times the police said, get home and poured his beer out or get home, you know, when he was underage drinking or fighting or doing something that maybe a Robert Ward or a Rachel Rollins wouldn't get the benefit of that if I lived in Warren Gardens or I lived in Columbia Point 
and the police officer didn't look like me or know my family or give me the same discretion because of their implicit bias. So we have to think about all of those ways in every single aspect of the system that explicit and implicit bias injects itself. Right. You're right. Um, Andrea, I want to shift to you for some specific things um, that I'm interested in and I think relate to this conversation about leveling the playing field, a form of, of reparation, if you will. I'm familiar with the Cannabis Control Board in Massachusetts that requires um, a reinvestment in communities that were disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, and do, or, can you tell us about that a little bit? How do you think it's working? Is it making a difference to the lives of people who should be benefiting from this legislation? Well, I think the law was well intended, and I think that it is it is making some progress around um, education and training and programming to help people get into the industry. But I think where the the law itself fell short, and I think part of this is because, um, and I contrast Massachusetts law with New York law. New York law came out of the legislature. Our cannabis legalization came out of a ballot question, which means that it went to each of the cities and towns. Um, that is That was basically its genesis. And there are some differences when something starts as a ballot question versus something that starts in the legislature, but our legislature was not inclined to move forward on legalization. Um, I think that there were there are things that probably should have been in the statute around um, the equity part, specifically in terms of if what you wanna do is beat back some of the negative impacts that prohibition and the so-called war on drugs had um, by making this an industry into which people are going to get a greater opportunity to participate at all levels from the, from the hourly worker level to the ownership and entrepreneurship level, then you have to recognize that you're dealing with a substance that is federally prohibited. Right. There was no access to commercial banking. And even if there were, we know that there is there are great disparities in who gets loans and who doesn't. But if, if it were, if banking were available, there would at least be some greater access to, to, to uh, capital. What the New York law does that the Massachusetts law did not do, and we're trying to sort of backtrack and figure it out now, is it specifically commits a portion of the tax revenue, a significant portion of the tax revenue that the state receives into a community re reinvestment fund. And I, I just have to shout out uh, Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, who was the, uh, you know, the she's an assemblywoman, and she is the majority leader uh, in the New York legislature, uh, and she she has been nursing, she nursed that bill for seven years, and it actually has the equity provisions that put meat on the bone of the talk of equity. So I think Massachusetts is is you were trying to make up for some of the things that were missed now. But, and as I say, I think the equity provisions are very well intentioned and individual companies need to be very deliberate about how they hire, who they hire and the efforts they make to retain staff and promote them fairly. Um, but I think that we're seeing some better versions of legislation come along in some of the other states that we could take a lesson from. That's great, thank you. Um, I really appreciate that perspective. It seems to me that it's a, it's an area of work to be done. And as you said, not yet realized in spite. And, and can I just say, we are Please. looking at a unicorn, right? A person, a woman of color, a woman who has been a CEO in this industry where, you know, again, she's much nicer and more graceful than me. And I try to learn from her every day, but just our numbers aren't good enough yet in Massachusetts, right? Think about how many black people have convictions because of marijuana, arrests and now it is a legal medicinal and recreational substance that is a billion with a b dollar industry that overwhelmingly white people are making tons of money right. on so the fact that we are looking at a ceo and tito jackson as well and a few other small exceptional people that have reached the highest level in this industry where poor communities and black and brown communities have been you know decimated as a result of these convictions that they are still reaping 
collateral consequences from. I think it's excellent that they've done it, but we have to really speak out loud and say, we have to be better to make sure that there are more opportunities for the very communities that were harmed the most. Well, you're probably aware of um, initiatives in other states, which I have not seen in Massachusetts, um, called Clean Slate Initiatives, um, where there's automatic expungement for offenses that are no longer <laughs> being enforced or people are getting convicted of. And it seems like that's an opportunity here to do a little bit of what you talk about, Rachel. How important it, it is, it. Christine, and what's so frustrating, this is an example, it's so funny, I sent a text to my team the other day. Marilyn Mosby and other uh, prosecutors are saying, I'm not prosecuting those type of crimes and making you know, sort of blanket statements, statements yeah. but our expungement laws require the defendant to the defend the, the defendant holds the right to expunge or not. And so and I hate things like this because I'm like, look, well then let's do the motion. Let's like put it out there somehow or put it on our website that we assent if you meet these three requirements, we'll work with Pauline Curion at the Greater Boston Legal Services or the people that are in this space all the time. What can we do to start yelling from the rooftops that we are willing to help people expunge these marijuana related? I'm not talking about, you know, trafficking and distribution or, you know, if it, if it added cocaine or other. I'm talking about possession charges and other things like that. Um, that are no longer criminalized at this point. We need to be better, and that's something I can work on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Here in North Carolina, um, on our own motion now, the legislature has uh, passed statutes that allow the prosecutor to motion um, for uh, the dismissal of charges or the expungement of, of records um, and driving cases. We've been doing those. And forgiveness motion, uh, the court for the forgiveness of fines and fees. We have dismiss thousands of old cases that were just sitting out there waiting for somebody to be served. I think some of those went back to the 70s. Um, and the North Carolina, as part of raise the age law, uh, there were certain uh, classes of felonies that you now, if you are under 16, cannot be tried for in adult court. Um, and so we are going back now and expunging the records of um, folks who were 14 or 15 um, and were convicted of those lower level felonies in adult court when now they would be in juvenile court. Um, and so this movement is, is moving forward. Um, folks recognize that times change and we want everybody, to, the way I talk about it is we want everybody to benefit uh, from opportunity in our community. I mean, I live in one of the fastest growing communities in the United States. Um, we, you know, the Raleigh-Durham area has grown by a million people um, since 2010. And, you know, we got a kindergarten class a day moving here into Durham County and our neighboring county, Wake County might have, I mean, has twice that many, right? And so um, it is booming here. And we want people who live here to be able to participate in that boom. And we know the thing that keeps you from participating in boom, in that boom, especially if you are a person of color, is a criminal record. And, and the only thing I'll add is even if you aren't a lawyer, but you've seen Oceans 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15, the other big, or 16 or 17, the other big industry, aside from marijuana, where we've seen in the last 10 years in Massachusetts is the gaming industry. Right. And so, you know, that you can't have a felony or a record and work on the floor of these casinos. So that is yet another booming new industry that is coming to the Commonwealth or has come here that we are missing out on. Certain communities are missing out on opportunities there. And the, the, the commissions, the cannabis, uh, the CCC and the Gaming Commission have worked really hard to try to remove some of those hurdles, but we have to be better on doing that. Great, great, thanks. I've got one more question from the audience and then I'd love for each of one of you to, each one of you to perhaps offer a, a closing statement before I turn this back over to Chief Ireland. Um, the last question from the audience is, you know, what do you think that we can do <laughs> to help the media understand the disservice they're doing? <laughs> by uh, 
by sensationalizing some cases, not reporting other cases, um, and being involved with exacerbating racial disparities. That's an easy one for y'all, right? Oh. Um, I think sensationalizing is the point. And I think, you know, we, we certainly, it's been, it's been a process, but we are clearly at the point where um, media struggle, social media, uh, and what goes into someone's feed in social media. I'm deeply grateful to the woman who was the whistleblower who's been testifying before Congress about Facebook. Um, I think that that is where media is at. It is, to some degree, it has always been about the advertising. It is now more than ever about the advertising and what causes people to click on the story and you will never lose a dollar validating people's prejudices and biases in the way that you write a story. And that's not to say that I believe that, you know, all reporters are, uh, you know, looking intentionally to vet their prejudices in their stories or are even intentionally um, gearing their stories toward particular audiences. I think it is a process. It is the frog in the hot water that slowly gets brought to a boil. Um, because we were, we were not where we are now even five years ago, certainly not 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. And I think, could the media do some internal education on all of this stuff, the way all other companies are doing it and other organizations are doing it? Yes, but they are at the end of the day struggling themselves with diminished subscriptions, um, people finding news that validates them and eschewing a, a more objective forum to get their news. Um, so I don't think that they're focused on it. And my honest answer is that I don't know that there is a lot that you can do at this point because uh, media is so polarized and you can pick your news, you can pick your truth. You can pick what you choose to believe despite the facts. That's where we are, and it's a scary, very dangerous place, but I don't think it's a priority for them. And my honest answer is, is that if it's not a priority for them, it's not going to happen. Well, apropos of conversations we've had earlier, thank you, Andrea, um, today about the, the way the media, port or the way we all portray things. You know, Rachel talked about somebody with a, a future promising life, or um, I, I know how frustrated I was. I still watch the evening news, and. Uh, as horrible as the, the death of this white woman um, vacationing with her boyfriend uh, in some Gabby national, Petito. thank you, I couldn't find her name for the life of me. Um, as horrifying as that is to see that on the news six or seven nights running when we know how many people of color, women of color um, are, are murdered in my own city <laughs> with great frequency that don't make the national news. And I, I just found that really heart-wrenching. Absolutely. Indigenous women, right, are, are murdered women. at rates that are just unconscionable when, when you think about that. And so, and, and honestly, I, I think one of the positive things that can come out of that, and obviously it's a tragedy what happened to Gabby Petito, but even her parents making the statement that we don't want any family to go through this, right? right? We appreciate how much coverage our daughter got, but we believe everyone deserves that coverage. You know, that's the story that those two parents having the compassion and the humanity to understand even in all of their grief that there are other communities. That's the type of story I want uplifted and told on every news circuit. I remember vividly sitting with um, Vanessa Masucci's parents, who had been brutally murdered by her husband, beautiful woman in Revere, school teacher. Um, we secured the appropriate guilty verdict against her husband, first degree murder. And I remember every news syndicate was out and Vanessa was beautiful, young child, awful, awful homicide. And I said, I, am, I appreciate you telling this story. I hope I see you at the arraignment downstairs a Cape Verdean woman had been stabbed dozens of times in the head and murdered by her husband who was being arraigned downstairs. Not a single one of the members of the media came down to that arraignment. And it's just a matter of like, 
if all lives matter, then all lives should matter. Good right? for you. Good for you. Satana, any comment on the media question? Yeah, I, I, I'm i going to agree with both Andrea and Rachel. It is a uh, my communications director, and I talk about this literally every day on how we do public education where people understand what we're doing and what our role is, yeah. um, and that we're not just responding to sensationalization of cases and, you know, kind of what an editor thinks will bring in eyeballs that day. Um, and, you know, the, the issue, I think also with cases like uh, Gabby Petito's case is that because it is beamed into everybody's living room, people don't know that's not happening in their community, right? And so it also encourages this idea that our communities are unsafer than they are. Um, and I also, you know, like Rachel says, we also need to be having a conversation in this country um, about the real risks that women of any color face um, from domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Yeah. Uh, and I would say in, in my office, we certainly have, you know, as some of the gun violence is intimate partner violence. Yeah. A lot of our murders are intimate partner violence. All people want to talk about is the gun violence, not about the lives of women and children that are lost in these cases. Yeah, thank you so and, much. And, and the last thing is, is just what, where we have to thread that needle is when we see what's happened with U.S. gymnastics, what we're oh. seeing, what's happened with professional women's soccer right now, and mm -hmm. some of the coaches being fired. There are systemic, huge problems where domestic violence and sexual assault isn't a woman's issue. That's correct. Right? That's right. It is. That's right an issue, right? And quite frankly, it's a men's issue where we need men to start standing up and being allies and speaking to their sons and brothers and uncles and colleagues when they're acting weird and like awful, right? At bars or elsewhere, but it starts in the home and making sure we're having those conversations instead of re-victimizing and blaming victims, which we do all the time. So I can understand, Christine, sometimes it's too overwhelming from you to maybe think about, but I don't wanna think about being murdered. Well, every woman and, and most Absolutely. people can think about an uncomfortable advance that they might have experienced, Absolutely. right? At any age they had. I don't need you to experience, nor would I want you to have the vicarious trauma of dealing with a homicide or a rape or a sexual assault or something like that. But let's at least try to expand how we're thinking about this and saying, you know what? No, this is sort of in my life because whether it was me or somebody I love that was assaulted or harassed, even if it's not criminal, if it's a civil violation, they've experienced that and it's a spectrum. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to invite each of you, um, Andrea, Satana, and Rachel, want to have any closing thoughts or comments. You know, one of the things I thought about is um, you may not be in the position you have forever. What's the advice you want to give your successor? Or um, uh, how do we make sure that the changes you're putting in place are staying? Uh, you don't have to answer those. It's really an invitation to, to make a closing statement and we'll go back to Chief Ireland. Andrea? First, thank you very much, Christine, uh, for mod uh, moderating this panel. And it has certainly been uh, a pleasure to be on a panel with Satana and Rachel um, talking about uh, topics that are very, very near and dear to me. And I also wanna thank um, Northeastern and obviously uh, Chief Justice Ireland uh, and the George Ruffin Society for putting on this panel. Um, I think, I think for me, you know, one of the best things um, about my career in government has been um, the ability um, to go into a job, determined to leave it better than I found it, in mm -hmm. some way, shape, or form, regardless of the amount of time that I was in that particular position, and to make systemic changes. Um, in the DA's office, it was about, it, it, there really was a revolution in those days around domestic violence and sexual assault cases, how those cases were gonna be dealt with in the courts, how they were gonna be tried and what the prosecutor's role was to see that there was actual justice in those cases. And in the sheriff's department, you know, it was reforming community corrections and, um, you know, as secretary of public safety, making the changes that I could make. 
but I would say, you know, the advice I would give to anybody who's in the position in government, especially one that carries power is to leave it better than you find it. But if you are in a supreme position or an executive position of power, as much as you can, make sure that whoever is selected or, or even elected to take that position after you is also going to continue that change because part of the reason we keep having the same conversations day in and day out, year in and year out, century after century, quite frankly, is because of the lack of sustainability. If you're an elected official, that means you help build a bench of other people who can be elected. If you are appointed, you use the influence that you have to make sure that the person who gets the appointment after you is someone who is going to continue whatever good work you have done. And in any other facet of your life, even in private industry, to do that, because it's always two steps forward, three steps back. At least it feels that way most of the time. We should not be having the same discussions about the same problems in 2021 that we were having in 1971 or 1961, and we are. So I would say that is a, a measure of leadership for anybody in government that I would hope they would take hold of um, and embrace because you can do that. You can create sustainability of the good work that you have done and give someone else to build upon a uh, chance to build upon that good work and make things even better. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. I want to say amen to that. Um, and I want to thank y'all for having me here today. It's been a great discussion. And just again, to co sign. You know, I am not going to be doing this job forever. You can count on that. Um, not, not just because this, this is, uh, if you're doing this job, I, I think, if you're doing this job with commitment to fairness and transparency, it's exhausting. And the amount of vicarious trauma that you yourself experience um, is tremendous. Just a quick story. I was getting my teeth cleaned and my dentist has this new machine that, uh, you know, she takes a picture of your mouth and they do it once a year and it can tell even just microscopic changes in your teeth and gums. It's really incredible. And um, the hygienist is cleaning my teeth and I said, wow, this machine is incredible. Now, if they find me decomposed in the woods, they can identify me. And she just looked at me like I was crazy. Who says I was that, like, right? I was like, well, in my job, that joke kills, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's true. In my, so I, you know, I don't want to be telling that joke uh, forever. But the point is, like Andrew said, I, I hope that my goal here is one, while I am doing the job, to be as fair and transparent in doing that job as I can. Uh, I cannot do it forever, but during the time that I am doing it, we are impacting lives, right? There's a prosecutor in my office who trains younger prosecutors, and he talks about how the work that you are doing it is pushing paper from one side of the desk to the other, but those are life-changing documents. And you need to always remember that that's what you're doing, that you are changing somebody's life. And so hopefully in these four years and in the next four years, we'll make uh, a difference in individual lives. And then my big hope is that we push this so far down the line that the next person who takes this job after me can't come back, that they have to keep pushing forward and that our community demands that they keep pushing forward, that they know what happens here, why it happens, and if they want it to be different, that they demand that difference. You're here, thank you. Rachel? I will end by, I know that joke, right. My 17 year old daughter says to me, every time I ask her where she's going, she's like, this isn't gonna end with a murder and a, a sexual assault mom, right? Because every call is usually how, things end for people, but um, I agree. And vicarious trauma is very real. Um, so I will start by thanking my distinguished co-panelists. Um, I have been a fan of the former sheriff and uh, secretary of EOPS from afar for a while. I had the privilege of speaking to her when I was a candidate and she is um, you know, as fearless as she is brilliant, first woman in many of the roles that she had as well, and a glass ceiling shatterer. And then I had the amazing fortune of befriending this wonderful other district attorney on our panel. Um, and it is a person that I can call and speak to about virtually anything. And it is a deep and real friendship, not just 
because we both happen to have the same jobs. Um, and when we both retire and are doing something very different, you will still be my friend, whether you want to or not. And then of course, Chief Justice Ireland, who I had the privilege of meeting when I first clerked on the Mass Appeals Court in 1997, which was the wonderful year that the excellent decision was made to pull him up to our um, Supreme Judicial Court. And I, although I didn't clerk for him, um, he is only my second favorite Ireland. He is married to the woman, Alice Alexander, uh, his wife, um, Ireland, who is phenomenal and was uh, my, a mentor of mine in law school. So it is a familial event. And I will simply just say, everything I do as DA is to mend relationships between my community and law enforcement. Because when you see me at these homicide scenes, overwhelmingly it's poor people and it's black and brown people who are being killed and who are being charged with these crimes. And I think if we have somebody like the women on this panel who understand how hard the police work to do it, do it right and get it right, and also how much our community deserves and wants peace and you know, good health, and the ability to go out and check their mail and have a barbecue or let their kids ride their bike in front of their house. We all want the same things. We have to be better at getting to yes together. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, and I am gonna continue doing the work no matter what my title is moving forward because there is a lot of work to do. There sure is. I am um, humbled to have been able to spend the last couple of hours with the three of you Thank you for your candor, your intellect, your sharing, your leadership, uh, and everything you, you've done. I wish we were in the same place so we could go get a coffee or a beer or a burger, because it would be great to continue this conversation. Um, I hope I have the pleasure of being in your personal company at another place in time. And uh, thank you all. I'll pass it back to you, Chief Ireland. Um, you can wrap it up the day. Thank you, Christine. What an outstanding discussion. You folks on the panel, you, you outdid yourselves. You gave us so much food for thought. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I want to sincerely thank all of the people in our audience for joining us this afternoon as we begin to discuss criminal justice reform. We hope that you enjoyed today's session, and we hope that you will join us for the next two sessions. On next Wednesday, October 13th, we will be discussing criminal justice professionals on criminal justice reform. Our keynote speaker will be Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and she will be followed by a panel of outstanding professionals. And then on Wednesday, October 20th, our discussion will focus on healing the community and ourselves. Our keynote speaker will be Judge and Professor Margaret Burnham, followed by another panel of outstanding professionals. We sincerely hope that our three sessions on criminal justice reform will lead to more conversations and more dialogue about criminal justice reform. In the end, we know that without open communication, things won't and can't change. And criminal justice reform is all about change. It is our hope that this program will be the first of many such discussions on criminal justice reform, not only here in Massachusetts, but across the nation. Finally, before closing, I want to take this opportunity to say that we are a nonprofit 501c3 tax exempt organization. And for those of you who are interested, you can make a donation to the Ruffin Society by going to the convocation website and clicking on the heading that says more, and then click on donate to the Ruffin Society. And with that being said, I thank you again on behalf of Northeastern University, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and the Justice George Lewis Ruffin Society. Have a great evening, 
and I hope to see you a week from today. Thank you.